It was a hot night in Alma, Arkansas on June 9, 1995, and Morgan Nick was catching fireflies. The six-year-old was having a girls' night out with her mom at a Little League game, but had taken some time out to play with her friends nearby. But even though the parents were keeping an eye on the girls, when the game ended, only two of the three children came back to the stands. Morgan was gone. What started off as a fun summer night turned into a waking nightmare, with an entire town searching for Morgan Nick, and for the man in the red truck who had been hanging around her. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Morgan Nick. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. story is one of the oldest ones that we've covered because apparently 1995 was somehow 26 years ago. No. Yeah, I know. It honestly came as news to me uh, because how could that be possible? No, I disagree with you completely. <laughs> I, I know the math is there, but no, it, it can't be that long ago. Yeah, it's crazy. But one of the main reasons I wanted to cover this disappearance is that despite the age of the case, it's still extremely active and there will be a clear call to action at the end for listeners. And, you know, there are ways that they might be able to help. Morgan Chantel Nick was born on September 12th, 1988 to Colleen and John Nick. She was the oldest of three children. A shy girl, she loved being a big sister to her little brother, Logan, who was three and a half, and her sister, Taryn, who was just 22 months old. That's a lot of kids to have in a short amount of time. I know. Yeah, three kids, 22 months to six years old. Like, that's intense. Morgan was a Girl Scout, and the reason she became one is honestly pretty hilarious to me. So apparently, her friends had convinced her to do track and field with them, which, like, side note, I love the fact that there was apparently a track and field program for six-year-olds. For six-year-olds, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But, I mean, so that's cool. But as soon as she started, Morgan was like, no, thank you, Mm -hmm. because running around made her sweaty, and she did not enjoy that. So instead, she wanted to sell cookies? Well, basically, like... You know, so I'm like, yeah, girl, same. Like, I also hate sweating outside. (laughs) Like, it's awful. Um, It bums me out. So according to her mother, Colleen, Morgan decided to join the Girl Scouts instead because, quote, they could stay inside and glue stuff. (laughs) (laughs) She's definitely a girl after your own heart. I know. I love it. Colleen Nick definitely had her hands full in the summer of 1996. In addition to being the mother of three small children, she and her husband had actually split up about six months prior. So she was a single mother to mm. three small children. Yeah, that's that's definitely tough. Oh, absolutely. Um, but luckily, the divorce was amicable, and Colleen seemingly had a support system. And But, you know, she also believed in carving out quality time with her children. So when her friends invited them to a Little League game in Alma, Arkansas, which was about a 30-minute drive from their home in Ozark, Arkansas, Colleen thought it would be a nice way to have some one-on-one time with her oldest daughter. Colleen's mother stayed with the two younger kids, and Colleen and Morgan set off for a girls' night. And I need to set the scene for this Little League game because like, both of our older kids were in Little League at various points. So I know I had an idea of what this situation was, but the more I read about it, I realized this is nothing like the Little League games that we sat through. Okay, in what way? Well, this sounds like it was the Friday Night Lights of Little League games. Well, yeah, so I thought it was interesting that you said it was uh, a half an hour away from their house. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, obviously our Little League games that we went to were just around our neighborhood. Yeah. But. So yeah, I think it was just like friends who, who lived in Alma. Um, you know, it was like their local little league or whatever, but, um, yeah. So one, it was late. This game didn't start till eight or nine o'clock. 
Well, how little are the kids that are playing? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's like the older little kids or if it's like also a bunch of six year olds, which would be awful, like terrifying, but whatever. Um, but there were also about 300 people in attendance. <laughs> What? I know. I feel like that's, they don't even have 300 people at the, like the world series or the world (laughs) little league championship. I'm sure they do. But like, yeah, I, so that's why when I'm reading this, I'm like, this is weird. Like, I don't understand this. But then I read some other things that kind of explained what a big deal this was. And there's just not a whole lot to do out there. I mean, maybe, I don't know, but you know, in any case, it was definitely the place to be that night. Colleen and Morgan met up with their friends, and they all sat together in the stands. Morgan was mostly content to watch the game with her mom, and even when a few of her friends came by and asked her if she wanted to go out and play, she said that she wanted to stay there and watch the game. But, as you know, Little League games can get a little drawn out. Um, And, you know, Morgan was only six. So, eventually, she got bored of the game and of her mom chatting with her friends, and so she started amusing herself by um, tying her mom's shoelaces together. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, every time she would do it, she would start giggling and totally just give herself away. (laughs) So, she's not exactly, like, a master prankster at this point. (laughs) That's cute, though. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, soon even attempting to prank her mom became boring. So when two of Morgan's friends came by around 1030 and asked Morgan if she wanted to go catch fireflies with them, Morgan asked her mom if she could go. And, you know, Colleen initially told her no because... It's like 1030, you know, her daughter's six. There's 300 people around. Right. Like she just didn't feel comfortable at all about it. But the other parents told Colleen that it was totally safe and that kids played in in the nearby field all the time. So they're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. We can see them. And it was. It was only about like 50 to 75 yards away, and they could see them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't going off super far or anything. And Colleen had apparently, at this point, she had been told before that she was overprotective, So she was like, okay, like if all these other parents are saying it's okay, against her better judgment, she acquiesced. Oh, God. Just the the feeling of, you know, coming back to bite you in the ass. I know. It's like, oh my God, I can't even imagine the guilt. Yeah. Awful. So Morgan gave her mother a hug and a kiss and ran off to play with her friends. And for a while, everything was fine. Colleen kept looking over at the girls and saw them running around and, you know, having fun catching fireflies. She told the Blytheville Courier News in 2000, quote, the last time I turned, I saw her running across the hill in a single file, end quote. So, like, they're just running across the hill with the other girls. And this whole thing took place over about 15 minutes. Okay. Now, we do need to get a sense of the timeline here because... Like I said, like all of it happens in a very short period of time. So it was about 1030 when the girls came over and asked Morgan to play. And then the game wrapped up just 15 minutes later at about 1045. Okay. According to that article in the Courier News that I mentioned, the fans started leaving to the right of the bleachers. And then from the left, the two older kids came back, but no Morgan. Everybody is leaving in the opposite direction of where the kids were playing. It sounds like it, yeah. Assuming everybody is leaving in that direction, nobody's paying attention to what's happening where the where the girls are playing. You mean, when you say by nobody, do you mean like... Witnesses, not the parents. Oh, yeah, like other attendees? Yeah. Or, no, you have 300 not, people not there. Um, I, the, immediately, I'm thinking like, okay, somebody had to have seen something. Yeah, no, you're like you said, they're going the opposite way. They're like, you know, I'm sure gathering up their own kids, gathering up the blankets, gathering up, like trying to find the car keys, stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's no outward appearance that anything is wrong at all at this point. Mm-hmm. Colleen told the Courier News, quote, from the time I checked and saw the two kids coming back, I had this horrible feeling, end quote. The kids, however, didn't think at that time that anything was wrong. They had been running around and they like ran down the hill and they last saw Morgan by a car dumping sand out of their shoes. So um, we have these videos up on our website, uh, 
of these two kids who were actually interviewed for the first time on camera 20 years after this. And one of them says something like it was like a weird sand that was there and it smelled funky. Yeah. So when they last saw Morgan, like they had all been taking sand out of their shoes and, you know, Morgan was by a car and everything seemed totally normal. The two kids finished first and they just kind of like headed back to the stands, which were nearby and just didn't, I guess, like look to see if Morgan was behind them. Yeah. So at this point, when the kids are like, oh, yeah, she's, you know, totally by the car. Colleen still starts panicking because she doesn't see her. And now there are 300 people trying to stream out of this place. Yeah, coming coming towards them, basically. Yeah, and so, like, it's so much harder for her to find Morgan right now, yeah. you know? Because I'm sure, like, a ton of kids, and I'm sure that there are a ton of kids who, like, kind of look like Morgan or or, or whatever. So she can't find her. So she heads to the parking lot because that was the last place that the other two said that they saw her. And, you know, she starts calling Morgan's name. She goes to her car and looks around the car, looks inside the car. Like, she even looks under the car, you know, thinking maybe Morgan's playing a game or or whatever. Yeah. But as the minutes tick by and there's no sign of her daughter still, Colleen's panic only grows. At this point, she starts to tell people what's going on. Um, And amazingly, since this was 1996, one of the coaches has a cell phone. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I talk about a stroke of luck because hardly anybody had cell phones in 96. Yeah. So he calls police. And in another amazing turn of events, they arrive like six minutes later. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how much time has passed um, since, you know, Colleen realized that Morgan's been missing. But I mean, we're talking just minutes. I mean, maybe 15 minutes. It's probably like 11 o'clock by this point. Yeah. So again, I mean, you can't ask for a fast response time in a missing person's case. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that's that's very fast. Yeah. By this time, when the police get there, though, the field had already mostly emptied out by, Mm -hmm. you know, by people who didn't realize anything was was happening and just kind of left. And Morgan obviously still isn't there. Police interview the two kids she was playing with, and they say something that chills Colleen to the bone. A man who arrived in a red pickup truck with a white camper shell came out and started talking to Morgan. The kids described him as creepy as he was only wearing cut-off jean shorts, no shirt and no shoes, and apparently he spoke with what they called a hillbilly accent. Yeah, so it was totally strange, but other than the lack of clothes, which, you know, wasn't incredibly weird for a hot summer night in Arkansas in in 1995, the man was completely ordinary looking. Like he was white and about six feet tall and around 180 pounds. And he had shaggy brown hair and some sort of beard growth. Like that's kind of changed over the years, Mm -hmm. Um, but some sort of facial hair. While the girls saw the creepy man talking to Morgan, they didn't see anything that really alarmed them. Like, they didn't see him grab her or, you know, anything like that. She didn't seem distressed this, at any point. But this still wasn't the last time the the kids saw Morgan. It doesn't sound like it. And that's the thing. There isn't a whole lot more detail. Even in this interview that they give 20 years later, they mm. really don't get into more detail than this. But, yeah, it sounds like they saw this dude talking to Morgan And then they saw her, you know, dumping sand out of her shoes. So I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm just trying to piece together the timeline. Yeah, it's, it's a little murky. In the days that followed, even after police interviewed the 300 attendees at the baseball game. They managed to get a hold of all of them? I mean, just about, I guess it's a small town, so I think they kind of put out the call. They just and probably just interviewed the entire town. Basically, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, but nobody said that they saw anything. It was as if Morgan simply vanished into thin air. So at this point, the police were probably wondering like how reliable this sighting of a creepy man in the truck was. But then they found information that made them positive that this was the man they were looking for. 
The very same morning that Morgan disappeared from the Little League game, a four-year-old girl was pulled into a truck at a laundromat. Luckily, the girl's mother was able to get to her and get her back. Then, the next day, the morning after Morgan's disappearance, a nine-year-old girl in nearby Fort Smith reported that a man tried to get her into a men's restroom, but she resisted. In both cases, the suspect generally fit the description of the creepy man the two girls saw talking to Morgan. How far away was the first incident from the in Alma baseball? in the same time in, oh, really? in the same town? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. And then the the next town was like I don't know twenty minutes away or something. Yeah. This news really did kind of drive the investigation, you know, toward this man in the red truck and thinking that there was some sort of like serial predator yeah. on the loose, basically. That's exactly right? what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, because it's a small town, a small area, and one abduction and, and two attempted abductions in roughly a 24 hour period is insane, you know? Um, like whether it's the same man or different men, it's crazy. And if it's different men, like, was there some weird full moon that made all the child abductors yeah, right. like yeah. turn into werewolves or something? Again, coincidences. No, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences like that. Yeah. But what's really interesting is, so as I was researching this, like every single thing that I read over the years said, you know, that there were these other attempted abductions within this 24 hour period. But then I read on some message board that somebody who works uh, with Colleen Nick actually says that that isn't the case. So according to her, the first abduction or attempted abduction of the four-year-old was actually like a custody dispute. Mm. And it was her father who had come to the laundromat and tried to take her. But she doesn't mention anything about that second incident where the man tried to pull the little girl into into the bathroom. So I don't know, but like according to the Nick family, there weren't any other abductions in that period, but according to every news article that I saw, there were. That's interesting. It is, and I don't really know what to make of it, but it definitely like puts a confusing wrench into things. Yeah, I don't really know what to make of that either. I mean, you know, of course, uh, news agencies are not infallible, and, and you know, maybe they got information that wasn't completely accurate. Um, like you said, the 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 one the laundromat the, one, yeah, yeah, could have could have been completely unrelated and could have been a custody issue, but maybe through open sources they found that there was an attempted abduction. And yeah. just kind of put it out there as as like a possible connection. Yeah, maybe. I just, I don't know. I really don't. But not mentioning the third one, third yeah. attempted abduction. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Yeah. So I'm not sure. That That is also interesting to, to note based on you behavior of abductors. Like, so you have one failed attempt, if this is the same person. Right. You have one failed attempt, what seems to be a successful mm -hmm. attempt and then within 24 hours or the same day mm -hmm. or whatever, the next, the next day, morning, yeah. A, another attempt. That yeah. Doesn't, so that doesn't seem to, to really jive. You know what I mean? Like, right. And that's what I thought too, because when I first read about these, the way I kind of misread it and the way that I read it, it sounded like the two attempts were the same day and then Morgan's abduction was the next day, but it wasn't. It was attempt. Morgan attempt. Right. And I thought that was weird too. I had the exact same thought, but I read uh, this blog post by a writer. So he's not like a police officer or anything sure, like yeah. that. Um, but he did look into this case and, you know, really kind of use a few different methods. And I'll post a link to his blog um, on our blog, but he used a few different methods to kind of like get basically a suspect profile mm -hmm. and he came up with a few different ones and basically, you know, they both boiled down. He go, he went into a lot of detail, but they both boiled down to either one of these suspects. He believed probably sexually assaulted and murdered Morgan within an hour to an hour and a half of her abduction. And that the uh, abduction attempt the next day 
would be because he was basically feeling powerful after that. And he was kind of on a high and wanted to keep it going. Sure, that's that's plausible. In the history of typical serial murderers or right. rapists or whatever, it's it's it doesn't usually happen so close. Yeah, and you're right, because in um, I was actually just listening to something about serial killers the other day, and they talk about one of, you know, the hallmarks of a serial killer is a cooling off period. Right. Between murders and where they kind of revel in the memory of right, what they have done. Right. Yes. And so I find it interesting too that like these three, you know, if they did and if they are connected. Yeah, if they are connected, if they really happened, I guess, that they all happened in this twenty four hour period and then nothing really. Y- yes, that that's that was where I was gonna go next. Yeah. Like I mean you, not to say that like somebody... crime has never again happened in Alma, Arkansas or around <laughs> there, but right. I mean it doesn't seem like this was the beginning of some sort of crime wave or, or yes. anything like that. Right. Again, if it's if it's somebody that's a, a, attempting these things in a serial method, mm-hmm. there would have been further indications, more of it happening. Even if it's out of the area, it's not going to... Well, but see, that's the problem because one of you know the possibilities here is that it's a transient person and... It could have happened outside of the area after this. Like he could have continued, but the cases wouldn't have necessarily been linked. You said, what year was this? 95? 95, 95, yeah. Yeah, I guess Amber Alerts weren't really a thing then. I mean, they were, right? I, well, so On television. Amber, Amber Alerts started like right around this time. And what's actually interesting is um, Amber Alerts in Arkansas are named after Morgan. Oh. So they're not called they're Amber Morgan Alerts. Alerts? Yeah, basically, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so her mom, like, has been, you know, fighting. And I'm actually, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about right now is, like, what happens to Colleen after this. You know, because I've watched several interviews with her over the years. And I've read a bunch of stuff, too. And it's clear that, like, many parents of missing children, she still harbors a lot of guilt and, you know, blames herself in many ways. Yeah, sure. But... Colleen took those feelings and immediately had them propel her into action. Right after Morgan's abduction, Colleen wanted to be as close as possible to the investigation and to the spot where her little girl went missing. So she and her family moved into the volunteer fire station in Alma for six weeks to head the investigation. And that basically became like the volunteer central, you know, location, like headquarters. Mm-hmm. Colleen told NBC News in 2019, quote, The community in Alma took care of us. It was pretty amazing, especially because we weren't from that community. We saw so much happening with law enforcement that while we struggled, we truly believed that they were doing everything they could. All of our friends, family, and churchgoers started grid searching. We opened our home and gave the officers our house keys and told them, do whatever you need to do to find Morgan, end quote. Two... The police's credit, it really sounds like they did. Local police immediately called in the FBI, who brought in extra manpower and resources, including like a, this huge computer system. Yeah. Um, because again, 1995, like the internet is kind of a new thing. Right. And, you know, this is a small town police department. Mm-hmm. So they were honestly probably still writing reports on ty- typewriters at this point, like maybe word processors. Yeah. But they probably didn't even have computers. So FBI came in, you know, brought all this stuff and immediately started helping. Then law enforcement also gathered home videos from people who had been in and around that the ballpark that night to see if they could find a red pickup truck with a white camper shell. That's impressive thinking. I thought so too. Yeah. And even though DNA was still relatively new on the scene, because, you know, keep in mind, this is just a few years after the O.J. Simpson trial, which is how like most people. Americans found out about, about DNA. DNA. Yeah. Um, police had the foresight to collect cigarette butts, bottles, and other items from the ball field, hoping to flush out a suspect. Wow. I know. I mean, it's amazing. Like, we cover so many of these cases where the police response is just lacking. <laughs> Uh, I would describe it as meh. Yeah. Yeah. And this honestly just seems like they were 100% on the ball. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really impressive response. Yeah, absolutely. But even with this blazingly quick response and seemingly thorough investigation, no trace of the six-year-old was found. 
And now remember how I said that Colleen immediately used her grief to take action. Mm -hmm. So not only did she, you know, kind of spearhead this whole investigation from the civilian side, but less than a year after her daughter went missing, Colleen started the Morgan Nick Foundation. The foundation's mission statement is, quote, dedicated to preventing crimes against children and adults through programs that educate, empower, and unite family and communities, end quote. And they do this by focusing on three categories, intervention, education, and legislation. And this includes educational resources for internet safety and an annual conference for families of long-term missing children. They also advocate for legislation, including the federal mandate for missing children signed by President Clinton and Megan's Law, which requires sex offender registration. We've linked to the foundation in our blog, and I encourage anyone who's listening to go check it out. And like I said, too, the Amber Alerts in Arkansas are named for her as well. Wow. Getting a real John Walsh vibe. Yeah. No, she absolutely did. I mean, this became her driving purpose because if nothing else, she just wanted to help other people experiencing this horrible pain to one, you know, she wanted to make it a little bit easier for them if she could. She wanted to help if she could. And then two, she wanted to prevent anybody else. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Colleen also moved her family from Ozark to a small home in Alma, you know, which is where Morgan went missing. Mm -hmm. And I found this out not from any of the news articles, but because in 2005, she was the subject of an episode of Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Uh, Really? (laughs) Yeah. And I watched that show religiously. (laughs) And I like vaguely remember this episode because Tony Hawk is in it. Um, So Colleen's older son is a huge skateboarder. And so as part of like, you know, the thing i because this was their season premiere too their season three premiere and so they were pulling out all the stops <laughs> so they like had tony hawk show up and meet him and his friends at a skate park and like teach them stuff and he signed <laughs> a skateboard and it's very cool yeah tony hawk's awesome we love tony hawk so I, I re-watched the episode though the other day when i was writing this and it's such a testament to the grit and determination that colleen has Morgan was her oldest child, but she still had two other, you know, young children at the time who she had to take care of throughout this whole ordeal. She ran the Morgan Nick Foundation from a cluttered desk in the living room of their home. And basically any money that she made just kind of went back into the foundation. Mm Mm-hmm. Since Morgan went missing, she has dedicated her life to her three children and doing everything in her power to help people in her same situation. It's so funny. It's been years since I've watched that show. Um, But like I said, I used to watch it all the time. And looking back on it now, like it's so easy to see like how they manipulate your emotions, but it does not matter as soon as they like started the string music and Ty Pennington, like had his little puppy dog face with like his frosted (laughs) tips. I just, and the puka shell necklace and the puka shell necklace. I just like started crying at my desk (laughs) and it just immediately got me. It was so ridiculous, but I mean, it was also genuinely touching because there's a part in the episode where she talks about being with families whose children come home and how it's the next best thing to getting Morgan back. But the two parts that got me the most were when they had a man from Nickmec come and go through the age-progressed photos that they had done up to that point. And then like the big reveal for the show was a new one that had showed Morgan at 16, which is the age she would have been. At that time, watching the progression of the photos and knowing that Colleen and all of these other parents only get to watch their children grow up on a computer screen, like I'm going to cry again. Like it really, it really got to me, and it, rem- it reminded me of our very first episode on Victor Shoemaker, Jr. You know, his parents like keep his age progressed photo in a frame in their house because that's what they have. That's all they have. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he was so little, you know, they have just little boy photos and then this picture of like a 22 year old man that they never got to meet. 
But then the second thing that made me just like completely weep <laughs> was during the big reveal of the whole house. Like, I'm seriously, like, this really got me. Like, the string music, everything got me. But they made a bedroom for Morgan. Anyway, we'll post that on the blog, too. And everybody should watch it and drink a glass of wine and cry. Though Colleen received a much more functional space out of which to run her foundation, the publicity from the show, which was hugely popular at the time, if you remember, oh, yeah, yeah. it didn't bring her any closer to get, getting her daughter back. Over the years, there have, of course, been, you know, a ton of theories. Any comment section of articles about Morgan invariably has someone who swears that they saw her at a gas station or their grandma saw her at a flea market and she's on drugs. And, you know, it's just, it's crazy, like, all of these stories that people are coming out with. But there have been some more solid leads as well. In January of 2002, police received a tip that was, quote, so specific about a property in Boonville, Arkansas, that they took cadaver dogs and did a dig. But after searching all day, they turned up no trace of Morgan. So do we know anything else about that tip? No, I couldn't find, like, any more specific information on that. And you can understand why, too. Because especially well, if they didn't find anything, yeah, they don't want to, like... Yeah, it's a dead end. Sure. Yeah, and they, if, if it's just some random person living there who has nothing to do with anything, they don't really want to ruin their life. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any tip or connection to the truck. Mm-hmm. I know. What year did you say that was? This was 2002. Yeah, okay, so... The truck might not be in the picture anymore, but yeah, but I mean, you never. It's all, know. It's all you have. It's all we have to go on at this point. Yeah, basically. Then in 2010, police searched a home in Spiro, Oklahoma, which is only about 25 miles away from Alma. The property was vacant, but it belonged to a man who had been named as a person of interest early on in Morgan's case. The Spiro Police Department said they were looking for evidence that Morgan had been in the home. And it's been hard to find specifics about who this is, but from what I've read, it seems like he was a pedophile who was kind of in and out of prison mm -hmm. over the years. And so my guess is, you know, he was a known pedophile who lived nearby, so police kind of had his eye on him this whole time. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure that he wasn't the only one. I'm sure that that's... No, yeah, absolutely. You know, they looked at the sex offender registry, figured out who was around at the time, well, and, I don't know if the, they even had the sex, sex offender registry at the time. Oh, right. Because that was Megan's law, and that was one of the things that the Morgan Nick Foundation helped advocate for. So they might not have even had that. But in any case, again, small towns like no police. Pedophiles. Yeah, police yeah. know who the local creeps are. Right. Um, so, in, and they had received tips about this guy as well. But again, don't know any details beyond that. And so when they did that search in 2010, nothing was found and the case went cold again. But then in 2017, police got a new tip about that same property. And that guy didn't own it anymore. He had nothing to do with it. It was just a completely new people who, you know, totally random people. Um, but this time they were searching outside of the house for an old well where the tip said Morgan might have been buried. Mm. In reading about the dig, like they were going kind of an inch at a time and just really thoroughly examining everything that they could find. But yet again, nothing was found. By 2017, like I said, the you know original person no longer lived at the property. Matt Mershon of KATV News tweeted, quote, Alma Chief says property being searched belonged to a person of interest in Morgan Nick case since beginning of the investigation. That person of interest is currently behind bars. Never been able to connect person to crime, but never been able to clear person either, end quote. Through the years, a few other names have been thrown around in Morgan's disappearance. In 2009, Michelle McNamara, who is Pat Oswalt's late wife, and she wrote I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is a great book, um, she wrote on her blog, True Crime Diary, that police should think about looking at Dennis Earl Bradford in Morgan's case. Bradford was eventually arrested due to DNA for the 1990 kidnapping, sexual assault, and attempted murder of eight-year-old Jennifer Shewitt. 
The arrest came 18 years after the crime, and Bradford was already in prison for another kidnapping and sexual assault in Arkansas. He was in the state at the time of Morgan's disappearance and generally fits the description of her abductor. Mm. Yeah, but his possible involvement remains a mystery as he was found dead in his jail cell in 2010. Well, that's not going to lead anywhere then. Yeah, exactly. Because with Jennifer, you know, Jennifer survived. And um, so they had a lot of DNA on her. Mm -hmm. And so they eventually, like I said, 18 years later, were able to connect it to him. But we don't necessarily have that in Morgan's case, which obviously makes cases like this a lot tougher. Yeah. More recently, internet sleuths have started pointing toward another suspect, though, Richard William Davis. Just last year, in October of 2020, genetic genealogy matched Davis's DNA to that of a man who raped and murdered five-year-old Siobhan McGinnis in Missoula, Montana, back in 1974. So after this genetic DNA link came out, investigators started digging into his life and like interviewing family members mm -hmm. and stuff. And they found that he had moved around a lot and would often lie to his family to cover up his tracks. For instance, when McGinnis was murdered in Montana, Davis had told his wife that he was visiting family in Oregon. He would also make up new job offers to like get his family to move, you know, without much notice. And so he was, even though a family man, he was also very transient. Mm -hmm. His behavior was so erratic and suspicious that the FBI is now actively looking for other possible victims in the area where he lived. And guess where he was in the summer of 1995? Arkansas. Yes. Specifically, he lived in Cabot, Arkansas, which is about two hours away from Alma. And now, as we were talking about before... Um, you know, as Morgan has never been found, there's obviously no DNA evidence from her clothes like there were with Jennifer Schuetz or anything like that. But the police presumably do have all of those cigarette butts and soda bottles that they collected back in 95 still. So if anything from those items can be tested and matches Davis, that can at the very least tie him to the area. That's assuming that they kept all of that well exactly and i, mean, I only I hope that, that this is still an open case yeah. but it's 25 years that's it's a, a small long town. time to keep evidence like that it absolutely is but i mean this case has been really high profile for the entire 25 years so that's why i'm kind of so hoping hope i would yeah have but we i don't know you know either way davis isn't talking because he is also dead he died of natural causes about eight years ago before it was found out that he murdered Siobhan McGinnis. But they have his DNA now. Yeah, so they have um, his familial DNA, so they can link him to any future crimes that they have DNA for. So in theory, if the police in Alma put any of these samples into CODIS mm -hmm. and it matches him, mm -hmm. there you go. Mm -hmm. And CODIS is the DNA profile. Right, database. Database, yeah. So. For the any, anybody that doesn't know what that right. is. <laughs> yeah, much like the Cherry Mahan case that we covered last season, Morgan Nick's case still gets an astonishing number of leads, even decades later. And now a five-part documentary series called Still Missing Morgan Nick is in production. It was supposed to be released last year, but I'm assuming COVID kind of derailed the filming a little bit. So it's still not out, but I want to mention it because producers have put out a call to action that I'd like to repeat. So if you go to their website, which is stillmissingmorgan.com, on their front page, they've written, quote, in an effort to discover new information in Morgan Nick's case, we are searching for any photos or videos from the days leading up to, through, and after June 9th, 1995 for use in the documentary series. And you can submit that right there on the website. So basically, if you know anyone who either lived in or around Al Alma, Arkansas in June of 1995, or if you did yourself, or if you visited, please search through any home movies, any photo albums that you may still have. And if you have anything, even if you think it doesn't matter, if it's just anything 
from around that time, please submit it to stillmissingmorgan.com. Alma, mm -hmm. police did an amazing job with the initial response. My, my only concern would be how much of the collected samples of DNA were actually tested. Right. Because that's not cheap. No, it's not. if it's, it's a not. small town police department, they might not have the money or financial resources to test every piece of evidence. Exactly. And it very well could be a case where none of it was tested because they don't have a suspect. Right. They could be waiting to match it against somebody as opposed to spending that money, yeah. like you said, running all of that through CODIS just in hopes that something comes up. Right. Or maybe pieces of evidence were were tested, but the mm -hmm. technology has advanced and CODIS has advanced right, because right. there was no CODIS back then. Well, exactly. And, you know, genetic genealogy, like solving cases that way is really only started happening, happening yes. in the last few years. It's new science. Yeah. It's very new. Yeah. And that's how a lot of these people are getting caught. And that's not how they were getting caught in 95, 2000, 2005, up until really about 2017. Right. So that's a huge deal. And so I don't know what the status is on any of that DNA evidence, but that's one of the things I'm looking forward to with the documentary, which Colleen Nick has been working with the producers, um, you know, so I'm sure that that's an avenue that they're going down because obviously that's yeah, and, all we have really. Yeah. And it's important to note that's not a dig on, on no, 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 police. no, no, that's it's the reality of the world. Yeah, unfortunately, I was, I was just going to say that that's the reality of a lot of police departments, even large police departments. Mm -hmm. They, they just don't have the resources to test every possible piece of DNA. Absolutely. Because, Especially when there's no suspect. Right. Because that costs or a, victim. a lot of money. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. And I wish that there was some way that funding could get out to those police departments mm -hmm. to do that because I, I feel like there would be a lot more cases just randomly solved yeah. that way. Well, and that's true because, you know, there was this like uh, show that I used to watch, uh, Cold Justice, I think it was, and they did this whole mini series uh, where they basically went to Flint, Michigan and cleared out a lot of their backlog of rape kits and solved a ton of rape cases yeah. that simply had not been solved because the rape kits were sitting there untested. Right. So honestly, like there's been a lot of talk politically about, you know, how good or bad it is to throw money at things. Like this is an an example of why throwing money at things can often be the only thing you need. Yeah. I mean, and if you're going to like, yes, that this is, this is something that, that this specific area needs more funding. Absolutely. Like, there is no logical reason why money should not be thrown at testing evidence. No, in a case. Yeah. Even if even if it if, even if it doesn't lead anywhere, at least it eliminates something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If if it's a piece of evidence that gets tested and it, and it goes nowhere, okay, yeah, it sucks. You spent a little bit of money on that, but like, it eliminates that piece of evidence for use. Clear it out. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, there is no real reason why money should not be spent on this. Yeah, like sell an armored truck or something. Well, we're not going to get into the political <laughs> aspects of this, but my, my point being is that, that that's where money should be funneled. Today, over 25 years after Morgan's abduction, her mother, Colleen Nick, still runs the Morgan Nick Foundation and is still waiting for her long-lost daughter to come walking through the door. In 2019, on the 24th anniversary of Morgan's disappearance, Colleen told NBC News that her faith and determination to find answers in her daughter's case remain as strong as ever. Quote, she's not a number. She's not a statistic. She is not a case file. She is a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, a friend. And she is someone worth fighting for. If you're not on the front line fighting for your daughter, no one else will. So it is my job to make sure she never gets lost. Until someone can prove to me that Morgan is not coming home, then I am going to fight for her. End quote. Morgan. 
Morgan Chantal Nick has been missing since June 9, 1995. At the time of her disappearance, she was four feet tall and weighed about 55 pounds. Morgan had blonde hair and blue eyes. She would be 32 years old today. If you have any information about Morgan's disappearance or about the man who was seen talking to her that night, please contact the Alma Police Department at 479-632-3333. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos on our website and thentheywweregone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we want to hear from you. You can also leave us a message at the link in our show notes, and we may play it on a future episode. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you get